Well, open your Bible, if you would, this morning to Luke chapter 11. We're going to turn our attention to Luke chapter 11. And then next week, Lord willing, Pastor Michael Babcock is going to be with you and he will be preaching the word uh, in this service next week. I'll be back for the evening service, but I'll be with the brethren at Calvin OPC next Sunday morning. And then in two weeks, we will begin our trek through the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And it's something that we have been praying about and working toward and and looking toward now. Uh, It was actually planned before we even moved here uh, over two years ago. And so I'm excited to finally be coming to the fourth gospel and rather intimidated at the prospect of preaching through that book again. But that will be our plan starting in two weeks. But today I want to speak with you for just a few minutes about a subject that I think is very important and yet very basic. In fact, much of what I'm going to do with you in this sermon this morning is to give you what I hope will be some encouragement and some suggestions for experiencing a more disciplined prayer life. I know that in the uh, the new year, a lot of people make resolutions, and it may be that some of you even resolved to pray more or to pray better. And yet, if you are like me, and I know that not all Christians are like me in this regard, but if you are like me, prayer is a challenging part of the Christian life. I have always found it to be so. Now, I have talked to many Christians over the years who are are just the opposite. Prayer is the easiest and most rewarding part of their Christian life. And reading scripture, studying scripture, memorizing scripture, that's that's the real challenge. But for me, it is just the reverse. Scripture reading is a joy for me. And it is relatively easy for me to give myself to. And yet prayer has always been hard. And I'm not sure of all of the reasons for that. I suspect that, at least in part, prayer is difficult because of the openness that it requires. Prayer requires a level of openness with God that is not necessarily true of simply reading the the words of Scripture. And it requires a, a level of engagement with God in the act of prayer that, that I know is not always true of my Bible reading. Unfortunately, I can read my Bible and, and go chapters and chapters through the, the, the teaching of Scripture and then realize that my mind has been wandering and I don't remember anything that I read at all. I wasn't engaged at all. But I can't really pray that way. To really pray, not just recite words, but to really pray, I have to stop and engage in communion, calling out to the Holy God. Now, maybe that comes naturally for you. Maybe that's easy for you, but it's not for me. And so very often I find myself, not just in a new year, but very often throughout the years and over the years, resolving that I need to pray more, but not just more, I need to pray better. (laughs) There needs to be more substance to my prayer life. We ought to feel a longing to pray. And I think that as the people of God, we actually ought to feel some need to grow in this area of prayer. And I believe that in part because of this passage in Luke chapter 11. So look with me at the first four verses as we introduce this topic this morning. Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, the Word of God says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he, Jesus, said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, from there, Luke goes on to include some additional teaching that Jesus gave on the subject of prayer. And he's going to return to this theme later in his gospel, uh, where he's narrating the, the work of Christ and the ministry of Christ. He's going to come back to this doctrine of prayer in chapter 18. I want to look at just these first four verses in this chapter, though, this morning and point out some things that I think are very basic, but very important for us to recognize I don't know how you learned to pray, but I suspect that I could guess 
Whether you know how you learn to pray or not, I suspect that the vast majority of us learned to pray by listening to other people pray. In fact, it's interesting to me, because of my own theological journey and the, the extraordinary evolution of my belief and thought, I have had the opportunity over the years to worship in many different churches and different Christian traditions. And I have noticed that there are some things that all of these different traditions share in common. And there are some things that are radically different. And one of the things that, that's surprising to me is different in different traditions is the way that believers pray. Now this was, this was curious to me initially when I started recognizing this and noting that different believers in different churches and traditions will pray in different ways. And I wondered why would that be? But then I realized that most of us learn to pray listening to other people pray. And therefore, within a particular local church or within a particular denomination or tradition, you will have the recurrence of certain phrases and concepts, the repetition of ideas. I even see this with my boys, by the way. My boys, when they lead prayer, sometimes in our family devotions in the evening, they will, they will repeat phrases that I know they only learn to pray by listening to me pray on Sunday mornings. Because there'll be phrases that I only use in the corporate gathered church that I don't necessarily use in family worship or when I'm just praying with some of the children individually. I know that they learned those phrases by listening to me pray on Sunday mornings. And yet they're just naturally assimilating that language and sometimes even the specific words into their own prayer life. That's how I think most of us learn how to pray. And it's what's interesting in this passage to me is that the disciples observe Jesus praying. And this was by no means the only occasion when he did so. We see on at least three different occasions, even prior to the Garden of Gethsemane, on at least three different occasions, the gospel writers point out Jesus going apart by himself to a deserted place to pray, sometimes continuing all night in prayer. And this appears to be a fairly regular practice of the Lord. The, the Lord's prayer life to me is astonishing. And I think what it points to is the, is the misconception that still lingers in my mind. Even though I know better, I still feel somewhere in my heart that the people who pray the most are, are the most weak. That the, the people who most need God's help, right? That, that really the strong people, that they, they don't need as much prayer as the rest of us weak people do. And yet the person I see praying the most in the Bible is Jesus. And if ever there was a, a man who was equipped to do the work of God in the world without constantly going to the Father, but you would think it would be Christ, right? And yet just the opposite, the strongest, the most faithful, the best equipped person in the Bible is the person who prays the most. And the disciples observe this. They see that Jesus is continually going away from the crowds and going out at night. That prayer is more important to Jesus than even bodily rest. How many times have I not prayed in the way that I should or for the period of time that I should because I was just too tired, right? Well, Jesus... Jesus chose prayer on many occasions instead of sleep. And if Jesus put that kind of emphasis on prayer, what kind of emphasis ought we to place on prayer? And this is not, a, this is not about out praying Jesus. You know, this is not about saying, well, if Jesus prayed all night, then I'm going to pray all day and all night, right? Because I've got to out pray Jesus. This is not a performance art, right? But what it should communicate to us is that if Jesus saw the need for that kind of focused and intense prayer in his own life, shouldn't we recognize that need in our own lives? And do you think that the disciples in verse 1 of this text, when they ask Jesus to teach them to pray, do you think that they ask that because they've never heard anyone pray before? I don't think so. I think these men, who were all of the apostles, appear to have been disciples of John the Baptist before they were disciples of Jesus, right? They've heard rabbis pray before. They've seen Jesus. They've probably heard John. And surely all of them, or most of them, grow up going to synagogue 
Hearing the rabbi pray, hearing the men of the community pray, going to the temple, seeing the priests pray. These men have been taught to pray in their homes. They have a confessional tradition in Second Temple Judaism where they are praying and reciting scripture every day. But what's different here? They see something in Jesus' prayer life that convinces them that they need to grow in this area. That there's more to learn. They don't just observe Jesus praying and say, yeah, I do that too. They look at Jesus' prayer life and they say, Lord, we need to learn this discipline as well. There's more that we need to learn. We need to grow in our practice of prayer. Now, do you and I see that same need in our lives? That's what I'm hoping that you'll get a sense of here this morning. Is that if if prayer is not already one of those areas of your Christian life where you say, I need to grow, that at the end of this study, you'll be saying, I need to grow. That we won't be content with our prayer life as it is today. But that just as we seek to grow in the knowledge of God's word, just as we seek to grow in holiness, just as we seek to grow in obedience to the revealed will of God in Christ, so too we would seek to grow in this discipline as well. Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, and perhaps this was something that would be practiced by all rabbis, that they would teach their disciples how to pray better. Now, verses 2, 3, and 4, you probably noticed, are an abbreviated form of the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. Most of us memorized and are much more familiar with the version of that prayer that appears in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. It appears to me, and I recognize that some critical New Testament scholars would dispute this, but it appears to me that Jesus does give this prayer to his disciples on two occasions. And that this is not merely a repetition of ideas, but that this is a model that Jesus is using to teach the practice of prayer, sometimes in a private setting and sometimes, as in the Sermon on the Mount, in a more corporate gathering. But here, Jesus gives this abbreviated form of the Lord's Prayer. And he goes so far in verse 2 as to say this. When you pray, say, and then he explains. When you pray, say these words. Now, that should tell us right off the bat something that was disputed in the churches that I grew up in. The churches that I grew up in said, you should never recite the Lord's Prayer. And we never did, right? In fact, they didn't even like calling it the Lord's Prayer. They would say it's the model prayer. And and they had a point, by the way. The Lord's Prayer uh, would really be a prayer that Jesus himself prayed. The only problem is that for 2,000 years, people have been referring to this as the Lord's Prayer. So after 2,000 years, that name is probably going to stick, right? Jesus is giving his disciples a model. He's not saying that these are the only words that disciples ought to say in prayer. He's giving them a form. He's giving them an outline. He's giving them a starting point. But the fact that he says, when you pray, say this, tells us that there's certainly nothing wrong with reciting that prayer. Uh, Sometimes, and and it depends on what your background is and how you grew up and what you've been taught and where you've worshipped, but sometimes people object to using a written or a memorized prayer like this. And uh, and certainly, like I said, my own background was out of that tradition. But but I want you to understand that the the Psalms are prayers that would be memorized and recited by the people of God for really thousands of years. Right. And and many, many of the prayers in the New Testament that we have recorded for us are actually uh, uh, heavily dependent upon some of the prayers of the Old Testament. There's nothing wrong with having a form of prayer that you might recite or say. What matters in prayer is not whether the prayer is extemporaneous. In other words, you're making it up on the spot. What matters in prayer is whether you mean what you're saying. Whether you're really engaged in addressing God. That when you say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What matters is whether you are speaking to to your Father those words from the heart. Or whether you're just reciting the words that are written somewhere on the page. The disciples wanted to pray better. Better. 
Teach us to pray. What what does that mean? I'm not sure what they saw that was different in Jesus' prayer life. If it was the words that he said, if it was the way that he prayed, if it was the length of time that he devoted to prayer. But in some way, the disciples see the need to grow in this discipline and we ought to see the same as well. And so let me give you some suggestions drawing out of this text, but also going outside of this text a little bit for how we might learn how to pray and learn to be more disciplined in our own prayer life. And the very first thing is this model prayer that Jesus gives us. It is introducing some structure into your prayer life. I think a lot of us, uh, maybe not all, but many of us probably have had in years past a very haphazard approach to prayer. That when we pray, we don't really have a plan. We don't really have a form. We will frequently tell people, I'll pray about that. And then we never do because we forget. Uh, And when we pray, we find ourselves very quickly at a loss for words. Because once we've prayed over our food and prayed for us to have a good day. And prayed for all of our sick people to get better. Then we're, we're kind of done because we don't know what else to say. The model prayer that Jesus gives to his disciples here, the Lord's Prayer, forms a very helpful outline that can be useful to disciples today in prayer. I mean, even the abbreviated form here, notice, Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is the idea of praying that God's name might be treated with reverence, that it might be regarded as holy. And so the prayer opens by addressing God in this intimate way as our Father and then expressing this desire for the hallowing, right? The sanctifying of His holy name. And then your kingdom come. Now, if you were to uh, chart out how much time you spend on various topics in your prayer life, I dare say that many of us would find that much of our prayer time is spent on very physical and material concerns, right? What most often occupies our mind in prayer? It's our needs, our wants, our fears, all of those kinds of concerns that we have often relating to material things. Now, is it wrong to pray about that? No, of course it's not wrong. We have examples of that in Scripture. We have very limited examples of that in Scripture. Very limited remarkably limited. You would think the way that so many people pray today, you would think that the Bible is full of examples of prayers for healing. It's not. You would think that the Bible is replete with prayers for prosperity and for health and for success in this world. It's not. It's remarkable to me that people can pluck a verse or two out of context, create an entire series of books and merchandise in the Christian community about praying for prosperity. And yet how many of us are spending serious time in the Psalms learning how to pray? How many of us are spending serious time in Paul's letters with his prayers, learning how to pray for the growth of the church? And for the spiritual uh, blessing of God's people. You don't have a lot of prayers about material concerns in the Bible. But you have a lot of prayers along this line. That God's name might be treated as holy. And that his kingdom might come. You think about the longer form that we're familiar with out of the Sermon on the Mount. Your will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do you think God's will is done in heaven? Do you think that in heaven, when the Lord gives a command that the angels say, hang on a minute? Do you think that they say, I'll get to that in a little while? Do you think that they dispute with him about what he's asking to be done? Or do you think that God's will in heaven is done reverently, gratefully, quickly, carefully? How should God's will be done on earth? Do you realize that when we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying not just in this world in general and abstractly, but what we're praying is that God's will would be done in each of our lives, in each of our homes, in the church, and in this world as it is done in heaven. 
You see, what, what the, the model prayer gives us, what the Lord's prayer gives us is an outline for working through the concerns that Jesus says we ought to be praying about. Addressing God in worship and in praise, petitioning Him for the kingdom. Yes, asking for daily needs. You notice there in verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. But it's, but it's give us each day our daily bread. It's not hardly the kind of prosperity, the abundant prosperity that many of us want or hope to receive. What does, what does this bring to your minds when Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread? Do you think about the manna in the wilderness? Do you remember the rules about the manna in the wilderness? That the Lord says six days, I will give you manna sufficient for each day. On the, on the sixth day, I'll give you enough for the sixth and the seventh day because there won't be any manna on the Sabbath. But on any other day, if you try to gather more than you need for that day, it will rot and breed worms. How, how powerful a lesson is that? For the people of God to trust God to say, I'm going to go out and there's food lying all over the ground and I'm going to get just what I need for today. And then I'm going to go back inside and I'm not going to worry about it. And I'm going to trust that tomorrow there's going to be food all over the ground. And I'm going to get just what I need for that day. And then I'm going to go back inside and I'm not going to worry about it. You see, we look at our refrigerator and our pantry and our bank accounts and our, our, our retirement accounts and, and we're thinking days and weeks and months and years in the future. And we're worrying and we're stressing about this. Jesus says, when you pray about your material needs, pray for what you need today. And trust that God will take care of your needs today. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter, two, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. And I have always thought as I read that passage, if I had been writing 1 Timothy chapter 6, I would have put more on the list, right? Having food and clothing and health, good health, right? Don't you want to be healthy? Maybe having a, 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 a shelter, a, a nice house, a paid for car or a motorcycle or you know, whatever. I mean, wouldn't you add some things to that list and say, then I will be content? He says, no, having food and covering for your body, that's enough. That's all you need. So why would you spend most of your time praying about things that are of relatively minor importance? Confession and forgiveness of our sins. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Well, you can't pray that unless you are. Unless you want to compound your sins with regard to prayer and, and, and make yourself a hypocrite as well. How sobering is it to pray for the forgiveness of our sins, recognizing that the demand of God is that we forgive just as we have been forgiven? And how does that even expose perhaps sin that lingers in our own lives? And lead us not into temptation, or as the fuller version goes on to say, but deliver us from evil, or probably better translated, the evil one. That basic outline can be used. You, you just start going through the Lord's Prayer. You, you pray the Lord's Prayer, but, but you, you develop those ideas. It adds structure so that you're, you're including those elements of prayer that are important, according to Jesus, for us to be spending time in prayer upon. Oftentimes, I teach a, a little bit different structure. When I'm discipling a new believer, I'll use the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. And many of you have probably done this as well. Four major Themes in prayer, adoration, that's another word for praise, confession, that is confessing our sins before God, recognizing the need for cleansing and forgiveness as we come into the presence of a holy God, thanksgiving, that is acknowledging God's goodness in our lives, and then supplication, that means asking for things. But, but the thing that I find helpful about that particular structure, and one of the reasons I use it with new believers, is that many people's prayer lives are dominated by asking for stuff. We treat God as if He were a vending machine. We only pray when we want to punch a button and get something from God, when in fact our prayer should spend far more time praising God, confessing our sins, and thanking Him for His mercies than asking for things. And so I find that structure sometimes puts our requests in perspective and may be helpful to you as well. A second thing I want to suggest in terms of a more disciplined prayer life is making a schedule part of your prayers. Uh, maybe adding structure to when you pray and not just how you pray. Uh, all through scripture, there is reference to 
Hours of prayer that are set aside by God's people. Listen to a few examples. Psalm 55 and verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. Psalm 119 verse 164. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Or Daniel chapter 6. You remember when the king makes a law that for 30 days prayer can only be offered to him. The Bible says in Daniel 6 and verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. This is his practice. Now, one, one quick aside, what I love about Daniel's practice is that his practice doesn't change because the law is signed. And it doesn't change in either of the ways that it could have changed. See, Daniel could have known that that law was signed and he could have said, you know what? I better start praying in the closet if I'm going to continue to pray. Right? I, I, I better hide my prayer life. He doesn't do that. He doesn't alter his prayer life at all. On the other hand, he doesn't go to City Hall and chain himself to the door and say, I'm going to make my prayers here today. Right? He doesn't make some ostentatious display of his disobedience and his defiance of the king's rule. He just goes home and he does three times a day what he does every other day. <laughs> and that should be our prayer life as well. Acts 3. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Acts 10 and verse 9. Peter goes up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. This is their practice. This is their habit. Right? Now... I want to say something here because I can anticipate a concern or a question that some people may have and say, no, wait a second. Are you saying that then uh, uh, there ought to be bound upon us a, a particular uh, set prayer schedule or hours for prayer? And no, I'm not actually saying that because that's not anywhere in Scripture. This is exemplified in Scripture in both Old Testaments and in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We find the people of God observing specific times of prayer. But what we never have in either Old or New Testaments is a specific command to pray at these hours. So I'm not trying to create a rule for you. I'm not trying to legislate something that God's word has not legislated. But what I do want to encourage you to think about is that if the saints in the Old Testament and if the saints in the New Testament found it helpful and appropriate to pray at specific times throughout the day, then Christians in the 21st century might as well. Failing to plan often results in failing to execute on the good intentions that we have. And I know there have been many times where I have intended to set aside more time for prayer on a given day and then have had other obligations uh, crowded out, as it were, because it wasn't an appointment on my calendar. It wasn't scheduled. That's what I do when I have a Bible class to teach. That's what I do when I have a counseling session. I put it on my calendar and I say I'm not available from this time to this time because I have this to do. But curiously, I don't do that with my prayer life. But what I'm suggesting is perhaps we should. If you want to pray more and more effectively, then plan your time for prayer. And, and that is in addition to, by the way, the kind of prayers that I'm sure that you and I often offer, which is just praying throughout the day, right? At random moments. I pray when I'm on my motorcycle. I pray when I'm, when I'm in the house. I pray when I'm studying a lesson. I pray when I'm on the way to visit someone in the hospital. I, uh, praying at random points throughout the day. I'm not suggesting that the only time you should pray is when you stop everything else and kneel down in your closet. But what I am suggesting is that if the only time that we pray are those random points throughout the day, maybe our prayer life would be enriched by adding some focused time to our prayers. And maybe praying for a specific period of time. And again, this is not to say that you ought to try and outdo Jesus or any of the other heroes that are written about in the Bible. But I have found it interesting in my own life. I had a, I had a, a young man that interned with me a number of years ago. And uh, he had a practice of setting aside 10 minutes every morning and 10 minutes every evening just for prayer. And you think, 10 minutes morning and evening? Boy, that guy's a lightweight when it comes to prayer. And I would ask you, how many of you devote 10 focused minutes to doing nothing but kneeling by your bed and praying morning and evening. Now, I'm sure that some of you do, actually. But I suspect that some people who would quickly scoff at that don't. 
And what you might find out is that the average length of time that many Christians pray is far less than 10 minutes. And that when challenged to actually focus on praying to God for an extended period of time, they run out of things to say very quickly. Perhaps because we have thought so little about the Lord. What I would encourage you to think about is that simple and sustainable is preferable to arduous and unsustainable. And that it may be good to say, I want to start adding some structure to the schedule of my prayers throughout the day. But think about starting small in that regard. And then let me suggest one other thing for your consideration this morning. And that is taking advantage of scripture with regard to the content of your prayers. The language and imagery and content of scripture should be a significant source of inspiration and motivation for our personal prayer life. When we're reading scripture, we should find many opportunities to pause and to pray to God, to thank him for the truth that he's revealed, to thank him for his promises, to confess sins that we become aware of as we're reading the word of God. This is a this is an opportune way in which to focus our prayer life. And so perhaps you want to add some structure to your prayer life by combining it with your daily Bible reading. And to say as part of my reading of scripture each day, I'm going to select one thing that I want to pray about. Right? And it could be any number of things. Well, let's go a step beyond that and suggest that maybe even using the language of scripture might sometimes be helpful in your prayers. I'll tell you, I use scripture uh, regularly, especially when I am praying about the, the being and the attributes and the beauty of God. Because I find that the, the language of scripture uh, addresses that in ways that, that I can certainly not improve upon and, and really cannot in any other way do justice to. And so going to Psalm 145 or Psalm 148 or Psalm 139. And using that psalm as a guide to reflecting upon the greatness and the glory of God and praying about it. Using even language from the psalms themselves in order to help me in reflecting upon God and praising His beauty. I have found to be very helpful. Our children, when they were much younger, as part of our family devotions, they had uh, memory verses that we would recite as a family every night. And then a motto that we would recite. And then we would always close... By reciting Psalm 4 and verse 8 as our evening prayer. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now, I guess you could say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And that's perfectly fine. But how are you going to improve on Psalm 4 and verse 8, right? Well, the truth is, the book of Psalms is full of prayers that are very readily accessible to the people of God today. I've given you some suggestions in the notes. I'm not going to develop that idea right now. But could I say just as an aside real quickly, all my life I have heard people quote scripture when they're praying and give God the book, chapter, and verse reference. And I have never understood that. And I might even be inclined to tell you don't do that because that kind of suggests maybe a level of ostentation and visibility that I would think might be inappropriate in our prayer life, right? God knows where, what book, chapter, and verse it's found in. Um, I'm talking about just taking the language of Scripture and using it as your own words so that your own heart is speaking through the vehicle of the words that the Holy Spirit gave the biblical writers. And toward that end, let me suggest that sometimes even a longer passage is appropriate. Let me give you some examples. Go in your Bible to Psalm 51. I will confess... There have been a number of times in my life where Psalm 51 has been my prayer to God. It is a, a prayer of repentance, asking forgiveness after David's sin with Bathsheba. And I have found on a number of occasions in my life when I am wrestling mightily with sin or mourning over some failure uh, before God that words fail me. I, I, I come to God and I, what, what can I say again? It's me again. And I've, I've blown it again. And, and how can I continue to be weak in these ways? How can I continue to, to fail to keep your law? And Psalm 51 becomes my prayer. Listen to these words. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. 
According to, the, to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now there are going to be a few phrases in that psalm or others that you might want to adapt a little bit to your own situation. And you might even use the psalm as kind of a jumping off point to begin praying the words of the psalm, but then be speaking to God out of your own heart more specifically to your present need. But what I want to suggest to you is that when you use Psalm 51 to pray about your sin, I think most of us will find that we're spending more time praying about our sin than we otherwise might do. Because I think for a lot of people, when we pray about our sin, we pray somewhat in this fashion. Father, forgive me for my sins. And then we move on. And that's not what David does. David soaks in his guilt. <laughs> David, David soaks in the conviction of his sin and begs God for mercy, pleads with God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. That's appropriate, brothers and sisters. We need to learn how to pray that way about our sin. What about Psalm 20? This is one that I have used, and actually uh, Nancy knows the staff. We have used this before in praying for specific people. In fact, we prayed this for Atlanta. A uh, year or so ago, I guess. And um, this is a beautiful psalm to pray for people. Again, you may have to adapt the language somewhat, but not very much. Listen to what it says. May Yahweh answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and the name of our God set up our banners. May Yahweh fulfill all your petitions. It goes on to uh, affirm the faith that we have in the Lord. How easy would it be to put someone's name into that psalm and say, may the Lord bless that person in their day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect our loved one. May he send that person help from his sanctuary and give them support from Mount Zion. May he remember all their obedience and their worship. So it's not very hard to get from Psalm 20 to the kind of prayer that you and I need to pray. Just as an aside, sometimes using a good hymnal, like the Trinity hymnal, can be helpful in this regard as well. Now what I'm suggesting here is not that you ought to discontinue the type of prayer that you may already be accustomed to, but that all of us might benefit in some ways by adding some structure, a little bit of discipline to our prayer life. So that like the disciples, we would see that this is an area of our life where just like all other areas of our Christian life, we need to grow. We need to be deepening our prayer life. We need to be enriching our prayer life. We need to be thinking more carefully, more biblically about what it means to approach the throne of God in prayer. We need to take that seriously. And we need to commit serious time to it. We need to recognize that prayer ought to be a priority rather than something that we just tack on to an otherwise busy day. That prayer is not the least important or least pressing need of our day. Indeed, it is the most important thing that we do each day. And it is time committed to going to God in prayer that enables us then to meet the urgent needs that confront us throughout our day. So I hope and pray that will encourage you. I hope and pray that it will help you in some way and that this year all of us will grow somewhat in terms of our prayer life and draw closer to the Lord in that way. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the avenue of prayer that you have provided us in the name of Jesus Christ through his mediatorship that we're able to come to you in this way openly and freely and know that you hear us and know that you will answer our prayer according to your will. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to grow in this grace, that you would help us to grow in our desire to be a praying people, and that we would not be complacent with regard to our prayer lives at all, Lord, but that we would hunger and thirst to be in your presence, to spend more time and to spend the time that we do spend in prayer, to spend it better 
We pray, Heavenly Father, that our hearts would be filled with reverence and with love for you, with gratitude for your good work in our lives, and that we would see, Father, the time that we spend in prayer is the very most important and precious part of each day. Help us, Father, in this. Grow us, strengthen us, and use us for your glory and for the fame of your name. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.